Hello, are you interested in knowing what are the routines of a chemical process engineer? If it is your goal, be welcome to the chemical process engineer diary. Here I share with you what are my daily life as a chemical process engineer working with plant design. So my main goal here is to bring to you my daily life as a chemical process engineer, answer questions, uh, clarify doubts or issues, and uh, be more close to my to to people that follow me in the social uh, in the social media. My name is Jefferson Costa. I'm a chemical process engineer from Brazil, and be welcome. Uh, today I returned to Instagram, so I I doing the the this live session in the YouTube at my right side, and also in the Instagram at my left side. So very nice to have you here with me, guys. Um, I took some time to return to the live sessions because last week I did a uh, few activities. So I went to another state to do uh, visits to a customer and the, the, the routine changes because I was in the hotel, I was in, in, with a small group and because of that I was not able to do the live session to, to talk to you. But today I am I returned to my home office and I have some some updates to share with you and I have some topics here. But if you have any questions, let me know in the chat if you are in the YouTube and if you are in the Instagram. Eventually, I can I can uh, ask you to join me in the live session. Okay, so. It is very, very nice. So let's start with my activities. What happened in the following days, in the last seven days? I, as I told you, I went to a visit to a customer and it is a part of a project that I'm developing for the company. And it is related to bio, biomethane upgrading, something like that. And right now I need to I need to, to review the heat and material balance of the plant. And for this project, we are dealing with two technologies. One of them is the water scrubbing and the other is the absorbent also, but with the organic solvent. And what are the differences between them? When we are talking about sweetening for biomethane, we are very interested in removing uh, CO2 because it is the main undesired component of the of the pro, of the process and to remove the co2 we have some technologies uh, available to do that and it, it will lead in cost it will lead in, in schedule or impact the schedule of the project but we decided to 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 proceed with the water scrubbing and also the absorb absorb absorption with the solvent, uh, organic solvent. And uh, the main difference between them, the, both of them remove CO2, but one of them was water, the water scrub was water for sure, and the other one was use uh, organic solvent that can be Selexol, Coastal, or there are others commercial uh, solvent for that. And the, while the water scrubbing is more simpler, we have an uh, absorption tower where, be, do you know the, the soda? So the, when we have the soda, there is the, the liquid and for instance, Coca-Cola, you have the, the, the liquid and we have CO2 dissolved in this liquid. And while the, the, bottle, the bottle is pressurized, the CO2 is inside the liquid. But once we, we open the bottle and the pressurize or let, let the, the, bot, the bottle with the same pressure of the location, ambient temperature, ambient pressure, the CO2 uh, uh, is removed from the soda or it uh, like evaporates from the soda. So this is disengaged from the soda. And that is the principle um, under the water scrubbing technology. We, we pass the gas with methane and also CO2 in the absorption column. And this column is pressurized and depending on the project, we, it can be seven 
bar G, it can be from 7 to 10 bar G, it's most common. And when we, we wash this gas with, so, with water, the water uh, dissolves the CO2 to, to the liquid phase. And with that, we are, we are able to remove the, the CO2 from our gas. And we have a gas that we can reach up to 96, 97, 98% of methane in the sweet, sweet gas. And to, to, to not expend too much water in this process, we regenerate this water. So the water is recirculated and we have two, two steps of the pressurization. One, the first one is to remove or uh, to recover the methane that is also absorbed during this process. So we return this to our, we return it, it to our compressor. And we have the second step of the pressurization that is the stripper col column where we inject air in order to let easier to the CO2 disengage from water. And also the other contaminants like uh, HOS. HOS is also uh, soluble in water. So with this, we are able to remove these contaminants and recirculate the water and with it, uh, save some water uh, during the process. This, the, the other technology, water, uh, the, the solvent wa uh, technology is very similar to that. We have the absorption column, but in this case we, we wash the, the gas with a solvent, organic solvent, and the organic solvent will absorb the CO2 and other contaminants. But to do the the regeneration of the solvent, instead of only having the, the depressurization of the system, we have some other steps also, depending on the, the, the kind of, of solvent that we have. So we have also the, the intermediate step to recover the methane that was, that was used also, and we can use heating, for regenerating the solvent, or we can use uh, a vacuum to, to be able to, to purify even more the solvent. And when we are talking about absorption, in this case, what, fa favore, uh, what increases the rating of absorption is using uh, lower temperatures in the solvent, because this way the absorption is increased, and also the pressure. Once we increase the pressure, the, we, we remove more CO2 and of course that there are some level of methane removed also. So what I'm doing right now is revising these two heating material balance because I need to estimate what are the, the products, what are the utilities, what are the raw material needed in order that we can proceed with the uh, uh, a license, uh, an environment license. I'm, I'm not so sure how it happens in the world, but in Brazil, we, when we, we want to start to, or to build a, a, a facility, we need, first we need to ask for some, some, uh, some government licenses. And one of them is the environment uh, Mm, environment license. No, it's not the. Uh, we have the preliminary license. Sorry, the preliminary license. We have the installation license, and we have the operation license. At least these three we have here in Brazil. Uh, as I told you, I don't know uh, in the in the other parts of the world. And what are the objectives of this license? And we have to ask them for the government. Is uh, we need to inf inform, in, uh, uh, give information for the government about the pollutants, uh, what kind of emissions, what kind of effluent will be generated uh, for this this project. So that's why we need to do that because if you are supposed to, to emit 
some kind of pollutant that is not uh, permitted will not get the, the license. So the first one is the preliminary one. So it's, uh, it means that our project is not finished yet. We are in the preliminary stages, but depending on the kind, uh, here in Brazil, we, we, we are federate state. So each state ha can have its own kind of regulation. And because of that, uh, some, some states are more uh, restringent than others, and we need to take that into account when we are installing a plant in, the, in, in, a, in a site. So, uh, as I told you, I need to have the heating material balance to be able to fill the preliminary license uh, form. So this is one of the reasons that I am reviewing the heat material balance. Another thing is uh, once the, we get the preliminary license, we proceed with the project and uh, another license that we have is the installation license. So without the installation license, although I have the preliminary one, I cannot start uh, erecting the equipment at the site, at the field. I cannot uh, install the compressor, I cannot install the columns and etc. if I don't have the installation license. And once the, we proceed with the project, we have more information and we ask for the operation license. And the operation, once in, in the life of the, the plant, we will, time, from time to time, we need to renew the, the operation license, so, uh, depending on the case, sorry, <coughs> it has a validity of five years or 10 years, so we need to uh, worry about that. But the operation license, once the plant is already uh, finished and is under operations, is a behavior or it's a, a, a issue of operations. Uh, we that work with plant design uh, I say the team of the plan design, it's not responsible for the operation license renew, renews, okay? So this is one of my main tasks and because of this, I have uh, also a lot, of, uh, a lot of meetings, as you know, I have meetings with the, the, the supplier of the water scrubbing, I have, the, I have meetings with the supplier of absorption, organic absorption technology, and that gets a lot of time to solve. Another, uh, I, I am involved with other projects, and one of them is also related to biomethane, and in this case we are in the step, in the stage of installation, so we are just reviewing what are the instruments, what are the the control valves and safety device that must be bought and I am reviewing review with the team if we, everything is okay in order that when we start the installation we are between the detailing design and the installation and to, to, to be able to start the installation after we, we have done the detailing design it's needed to buy all the stuff that are needed, the equipment, the instruments, the, the fittings, and etc. So we, I, I helping the team to identify if everything that was detailed, it was already bought in order that we can install, uh, start the installation. It, uh, it is not, uh, uh, let's say, a regular, a regular uh, role or responsibility of the chemical engineer in big companies because when we are in big companies, uh, the, the things is, is very well separated. Each one has its own uh, roles. But here, as I am in a, in a medium to a small company, the, the team is very, is very uh, small. We, we are about no more than 10 people to, to do the process, uh, instrumentation, automation, mechanical and piping, uh, planning, and etc. Just to let you know, here in this company, my role is the chemical process engineering, but we also do the instrumentation part of the process. 
So in big companies, the uh, very often the instrument engineer is a dedicated person just to look for the instrumentation. And instrumentation includes control valve, pressure safety devices, and etc. Here, as it is a, a small team, I am also responsible for the instrumentation. And because of that, I learned a lot of things. Uh, in my point of view, it's not, uh, it's not uh, 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 bad, uh, although I have more, more work to do, or more work to do, I, I learn more and it will help me in the future uh, with my students, with my career, and that's very, very nice. And just to remind you, I, am, I, I will do the chemical process engineer journey next, uh, next month on May, and you still have time to, to do your registration. And in this event, in this workshop, I will share with you what, the, what chemical process engineers must know to work with plan design. So if you are interested on knowing what are the roles, what are the responsibilities, what kind of documentation is issued, by the chemical process engineer and also the companies and what they want from, from you. Uh, it, you still have time to register, so you will find in the description of this video the, the link to registration. And in these three days, I will share with you not only technical stuffs, but I will also uh, share with you some special videos to encourage you to not give up from your dreams. So the, this is my invitation for you. And today I have reviewed some, some emails that I received from, from people. So uh, must, it's most common to receive some emails. Once one uh, from people that registered to my free training, uh, Chemical Process Engineering Plan Design. In this free training, you can find that in, in my blog, in my website. I invite people to share their questions with me and I receive a very interesting question about what is or what are the benefits of being a shattered chemical engineer. In Brazil it's not common to have this kind of title. I have seen that people from India, they have a lot. My, my dear friend Vijay Sarat is a shattered chemical engineer and these uh, so what I will do, I will, I will do a research about the subject and in, uh, soon I will return to do a live session specifically about it. I have other friends that has this shattered chemical engineering title and uh, it's, uh, I think it's issued by the Institute of Chemical Process Engin uh, Chemical Engineers, but I am not so sure. I, I will verify what are the, the requirements and etc. And eventually I will apply to that to verify if I am good enough to have this title. I'm not so sure. In Brazil, we don't use this, okay? Uh, I have received also another question and this is an interesting question because uh, I have a lot of videos in my YouTube and in one of these videos, I share how to do the uh, the preliminary simulation of a steam methane reformer. In fact, I do a revision of this process. A steam methane reformer is used to produce hydrogen from, uh, from natural gas or hydrocarbon source. So what happens is that we get natural gas, we mix that with steam. There is a minimum proportion to avoid coking of the, the hydrocarbon inside the furnace. In the furnace is the step of uh, uh, endo endothermic reaction. So we form the syn gas that is mainly hydrogen, CO, and the, the remaining in the steam that was not uh, uh, was not uh, reacted. And to improve the the formation of hydrogen, we we send this, this stream for the shift reactor. So in the shift reactor, we have the, we have the external uh, exothermic reaction. So in the first one, we need to add, to add energy. That's why we use a furnace to add heat 
from burning uh, uh, fuel gas to the, the process. And the second step, we have a shift gas where we this release energy and we, we control the temperature to get the best the best efficiency of the process. And once we have the, the shift gas, we still have the, the steam, we have some impurities, we have unconverted uh, uh, raw material, and we send that to a PSA. Normally, it's a set of PSA more than two. I have seen uh, process with four, with six, and it depends on the, the, the sensor and we purify the hydrogen in order that it can be, be sent to the customer or it can be uh, storage for, for commercial purpose. And the question that I received was uh, about a, a, a guy that is a supplier of some stuffs for, for plants and he asked me about what are the quantity and kinds of pumps and also what are the, the types of valve that steam and reformer uses or uh, is applied. And it is an interesting question because, in fact, there is no much, much pumps in steam and reformer, reformer process because we, we have uh, two gases. We have uh, natural gas as, as a gas. We have steam as a, a vapor. So we are talking about, we don't use pumps to, to drive energy for them. And all the, the process, the main process, of course, is in gas phase. So we don't use the pumps for, for this case. When we have pumps in the steam reformer process, we will have pump if we are using a uh, a liquefied hydrocarbon, or for instance, if you are using naphtha to, to be a raw material for, for the syngas reaction, we we'll use pumps because the naphtha will be stored as liquid phase. We will we'll pump that to a source of energy to vaporize and our reactions in steam and reformer will be ours in the gas phase. So we need to evaporize the liquid and send to to the, the process. So we have one pump here. We have another pump in the we as we we are using steam to the process. This this steam must be very very pure. We we don't we cannot have uh, calcium. We don't we cannot have uh, chlorates and etc. Because uh, of the high temperature and the high pressure, we can damage the we increase the rate of corrosion, we can increase the, the rate of damage of the equipment. So what we use is demineralized water to this process. And uh, as we have demineralized water, we have, a, uh, usually depending on the kind of the process, we have a, a osmosis reverse process as a utility of this kind of plant. So there we have a lot of pumps because we are talking about liquid for produce the demineralized water, but it is, usually it is a, a closed scope. So we we go to the market and we ask it, we, we inform the requirements that we need for our our water, and with that we get a, a, a proposal for a specific supplier or a vendor. But this, this steam that we use dur during the process, we need to remove them from the, the, the mainstream. So we have some coolers during the, the process. It can be uh, cooling waters, but most often we are, when we are talking about uh, big plants, we have air, air coolers. And with that, we condensate the, this the mean water and it, receive, it goes to a the uh, aerator equipment to remove the, the air, any kind of air that we can have inside this water, and we recirculate that again for the, the steam generator. That is one of the parts of the system. We have so much heat in the process that we are able to, to produce the, the steam that are needed to the process. 
So based on that, we have uh, naphtha pump, we have uh, the mean uh, body feed water pump, and eventually if we have the cooling water system, we can have also uh, more two or three, depending on the size of the plant, of course, but uh, at least we have two because it's a matter of reliability. Depending on the, the system that we are talking about, we use two equipments to run the plant because the, the refrigeration in some parts of the system, it's very, very important. And if I have only one pump and if the, its pump fails, I will stop my production and to prevent the being too much time without producing because my equipment that was uh, in maintenance, for instance, I have two equipments at the site or at the process. And it is very, very common when we are talking about rotating equipment. We, if uh, for, for instance, in the, in the plant that I am I am working in the biomethane, we have uh, some pumps in the system and uh, it is one parallel, one standby pump in the, in the system because if one stops, the other one will run. I have some blowers also in, in standby because if I run with two blowers, one of them stops, I have the other one. It's very, very common for for rotating equipments, because a re rotating equipments different from static equipments, they need to have some kind of maintenance regularly. So, so from time to time, we need to have some kind of maintenance. Imagine your car, your car, or uh, your family's car. Time to time needs to to refill the oil, re needs to verify the the tires and etc. And to do that, we need to stop the let let that available for a off uh, off scene. So, uh, if you don't have another car to to be used, you need to and let the uh, analogy for operations. You need to wait for the car is is ready for you again. And to prevent that we have uh, another unit, another car available. So while it is in the off scene, we can run with the other one. Okay, so this is the, the concepts of having a standby equipment. And there are, when we talk about multiple equipments in uh, plan design, we have the standby equipment, we can have the spare equipment or spare equipment and we can have the backup equipment although they seem they seems to be the same it's not the same and i have one of these videos that is available here talks about this subject okay so i will uh, in, in instagram you can it's easier to find them because i named them according to the the title it and, but in the YouTube, I will organize it better for you to, to have this access, access to these videos. And, and, to, and finally, uh, in, in the points that I have here to share with you, and I didn't receive any questions today, so I, I will finish the, the, the live session in some minutes. Uh, I have I have received a message about people that is, are not able to join my Telegram channel. Currently, I have I have two Telegram channels. Uh, the first one is the main one in Telegram channel in process. In this Telegram, I share with uh, with members uh, updates about the my my posts in LinkedIn, in YouTube, in social media. Uh, from, from regularly or time to time, I record some audios, uh, answering some questions that I received, and it's a way that I have to be, be closer to you that follow me. And now I'm doing live sessions, so my Telegram is not, is not being so, so used, but I still have a lot of content to my Telegram channel in process. And for this period, to the workshop, I have an exclu exclusive Telegram channel for them, 
for members, for people that will participate in the workshop. So there, I, I will I will share some material that I will use in the in the workshop. So if you want to receive the materials from the workshop, you need to have to be in the uh, workshop Telegram. And what happens when we we try to to join a Telegram channel when we are in LinkedIn? LinkedIn for for some reason it blocks the access to Telegram. So what you need to do to join my Telegram channels? You to go to the main one, you can go to my website jeffersoncosta.com and you find the link. So from your bra internet browser, you just click and accept the the invitation. And of course, that you need need to install the Telegram to your cell phone. And for join the for join. The, the workshop Telegram, you need to register, and once you register, you will receive an email. And in this email, you have the link to join. So this, these steps must be done in the internet browser. If you are inside the LinkedIn uh, apps, you are not able to do that. But it's very, very easy to solve. So this is my tips for you. So I have seen that some, some people uh, interact with me here in YouTube. We start with YouTube, my Coffee Academy. Coffee Academy is from my, my brother, and I am very proud of him. He works with finances. And I have here a uh, hi from Murali Daham. Very nice to have you here, Murali. And in the, in the Instagram, a uh, lot of people here appeared. And thanks a lot, Geralda Regina. And we, Geralda Regina is my wife, so take care about, about her. Orlando. And there are some, some names that I'm not able to read, okay? Polad, Sagheb, uh, Amiru, Assunção, Diego. Uh, Diego is a very good friend. We are, I don't know if you know about R RPG or role playing games. We are at the same team. We work, uh, we, we play RPG frequently, not the video game, the, the, live, the live ones. And I have here Dihaj. Hello, Dihaj. Nice to have you here with me in this live session. So, guys, this is it. Thanks a lot for following this. As I told you, this section is to share with you my, my activities as, as a chemical process engineer working with plant design. And every time that I have uh, questions, comments, or feedbacks, I will be here to share with you and clarify what I can clarify to you. And now it's time to return to my work. Today I will restart my work earlier because I have these process simulations to review. So this is it. I hope you like it and I'll see you soon in the next live session. Bye bye.